Namaskar, respected dignitaries, all invited guests, ladies and gen gentlemen. On behalf of India Foundation, I'm truly delighted to welcome you all at this sixth Atal Bihari Memorial Lecture hosted today on the occasion of 99th birth anniversary of this visionary leader. Instituted in 2018 to honor the memory of Bharat Ratan, late Sri Atal Bihari Bajpayee and carry forward his legacy of political leadership in a parliamentary democracy, the lecture is annually delivered by individuals who exemplify values that Atalji stood for. As we start our proceedings today, we will begin by screening a short video on Atalji, one of the most iconic leader and statesmen of independent India. Video also covers glimpses of our former memorial lectures held on this occasion. <laughs> Probably one of the greatest orators that India has seen, a product of parliamentary democracy, a man who always measured his words, a man who had the capacity to place national interest higher than his own party interest, an excellent poet who used the facility of language that he possessed to pierce and penetrate every point that he wanted to make. His era spread through generations. What do I regard as his greatest achievement? Indian democracy because of two political parties as national parties became a viable parliamentary democracy. As a statesman and a political stalwart, he dominated the national space for a very long period of time. As a Prime Minister, he kept the nation first. As an opposition leader, he was served, but matured in his critique. As a Democrat, he was one of the few leaders who thought of every angle before taking a decision. fast track development in various sectors ranging from air connectivity, rail connectivity, port connectivity, even political connectivity also. And he was able to provide a able leadership and also a stable government. Atalji was much more than a politician. He was essentially a sensitive and compassionate soul. So he naturally took to poetry to give expression to his anguish and pain caused by the poverty, by the backwardness and degradation in which his own people were living. सुशासन के जरिए समाज के हर वर्ग को सशक्त बनाना बाजपेयी जी का जीवन दर्शन था। टूटे हुए सपने की सुने कौन सिसकी? टूटे हुए सपने की सुने कौन सिसकी? अंतर को चीर व्यथा पलकों पर ठिठकी हार नहीं मानूंगा रार नहीं ठानूंगा काल के कपाल पर लिखता मिटाता हूँ गीत नया गाता गीत नया गाता As we remember this great leader today, we have called upon 
selected stalwarts from different walks of life who had the opportunity to work closely with Adil ji during his tenure as the Prime Minister of India to share their reminiscences as we go down the memory lane. Let me call upon Ambassador Kabul Sibbal, former Foreign Secretary of India, General VP Malik, former Chief of Army Staff, Indian Army, and Sri Shuresh Prabhuji, former Minister, Government of India, and Chair of the Session to join us here on the dais. I also request Admiral Shekhar Sinaji, Chairman, Board of Trustees at India Foundation, and Captain Alok Bansal, Director, India Foundation, to also join us on the dais. Uh, I would now like to request Ambassador Kaval Sibyl for his remarks. Ambassador Kaval Sibyl had a distinguished career as a diplomat that concluded when he retired as India's Foreign Secretary in 2003. In his 37 years of service at the Ministry of External Affairs, he had held several key jobs, including Ambassador of France, Egypt, Turkey, and Deputy Chief of Mission at Indian Embassy in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Kaval Sibyl was Foreign Secretary to Government of India from 2002 to November, from July 2002 to November 2003. He was also a member of India's National Security Advisory Board from 2008 to 2010, and recently he has been designated as the Chancellor of Jawaharlal Nehru University. Kaval Sibyl's book of poems, Snowflakes of Time, is a reader's delight. He is recognized as one of the contemporary India's foremost strategic minds and an influential columnist and voice in shaping India's foreign policy and deepening its engagement with both, with both its neighborhood and the world. Having served closely with the stalwart politician and former Prime Minister Sri Atal Bihari Bajpayee, sir, we look forward to, to, his, uh, uh, to your reminiscences with this great leader. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much for your very generous words of introduction and for inviting me uh, to this occasion, which is very special, obviously, and in the company of very distinguished uh, people. Um, I can't improve at all on what was said earlier by the stalwart politicians of India about uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, who they have summed up so well his contribution to national life, his personality, his uh, poetic uh, uh, temperament, his uh, care for the uh, people, uh, etc., etc. So whatever I would say would pale by comparison because I have a little handicap. I never saw him as a parliamentarian. Uh, during that phase of his life, I was largely abroad. Um, and therefore I saw him uh, at a distance. And whatever knowledge I have of him, his personality, his thinking, his beliefs, is based on what others have said and uh, have delineated as part of his personality. However, however, uh, I interacted with him uh, on several occasions, especially <coughs> when I was foreign secretary. Uh, oh no, I think I must modify that interacted with him on several occasions doesn't mean a personal interaction. Uh, because uh, as things are structured, uh, the, the uh, Prime Minister is not available so easily to foreign secretaries to discuss foreign policy. Uh, uh, and especially in his case, he had a very powerful gatekeeper, <laughs> Bridesh Mishra, who, who was totally in control of everything, Principal Secretary and National Security Advisor. And therefore, whatever uh, one wanted to know about him, his thinking, his policy directions, his preferences, his choices, were intermediated by, uh, by uh, the, uh, by Bridgesh Mishra. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, s since I traveled with him to several countries and had occasion to interact with him in that format, uh, I can only so give you some anecdotal things, though in part they are also pretty substantial, as I will draw it out. I first met him in Tanzania 
I forget the date, I think it was 1977 when he was foreign minister. And uh, uh, he wanted Indian food. So um, very difficult to get Indian food in 1977 in Tanzania. There was not much food in any case. <laughs> so so uh, we prepared a very nice meal for him and it was a big compliment he, he paid. He says, So that pleased my wife a, a, a great deal. Uh, he uh, spoke to the Indian community, and that is where his personality came out. Otherwise, he was not very talkative or communicative, uh, but when he was before an Indian community audience, his personality flowered, changed uh, completely, and he gave a brilliant lecture, animated, full of humor, full of passion, very articulate. And then, of course, there was a general demand from the audience that he read his poems. And one of the poems he read was one of the couple of lines that were just recited just now. And he recited it with a tremendous uh, flair. He was a man who spoke uh, very deliberately, chose his words very carefully, um, to the extent that uh, his interlocutors did not always realize that he had finished exposing his thoughts. Because just as they thought that they could intervene and reply to what he had said, he would start uh, talking again. Uh, that was his style. Uh, but very carefully chosen words. And I remember when he met President Chirac, Chirac said uh, that, you know, it's afterwards when you recall what he said you start wondering what he exactly meant, because it could be interp interpreted in various ways. Uh, so that also is diplomatically uh, very helpful because you don't commit yourself uh, to, a, to a position and you leave a, a, a door open. This was when he came to France when I was ambassador there in September in 1998. And that was the time when we strengthened our strategic partnership uh, further. Uh, to my mind, to my mind, the biggest, the biggest, the biggest contribution that Prime Minister Vajpayee made to national security and to the nation was his decision to go in for nuclear tests. It was a very bold decision. Um, there were a lot of concerns that there will be a big backlash, there will be sanctions, which of course were applied, led by the United States of America that our economy uh, could face very serious problems, which is why we launched that, uh, I forget, that scheme uh, to mop in uh, foreign in, uh, Indian diaspora investment into the country. And uh, we got a few billion dollars. Um, now, the thing was that France was the only uh, country apart from Russia that uh, said there will be no sanctions that it will be business as usual uh, with India. Um, in fact, uh, uh, when Prime Minister Vajpayee went, uh, this helped in solidifying the strategic breakthrough uh, that we had in France. And President Chirac, uh, uh, I remember the conversations, he said, look, you know, the biggest problem I have uh, with the, the West with my partners is uh, the Jean Chrétien, the Prime Minister of Canada. He is the most difficult on this issue of sanctions. Uh, but I'm working on him. I'm working on him. So, but France was caught in a difficult position. The member of NATO, member of P5, had signed the non-proliferation treaty, had those commitments, and could not simply approve of our tests uh, publicly and break away completely from the UN on this issue. But beyond that, uh, I know in terms of technology transfer, some very sensitive things for our, uh, I won't mention those things, they, they were open. Uh, um, the, uh, in f talking about his uh, 
play with words and the ambiguity <laughs> in his discourse. In, fe in February 1998, when he uh, visited, when Chirac visited India, they were very, very keen to sell us air buses. And I was present at that conversation. And uh, so when Chirac came out, Prime Minister Raffarin, he was speaking in French, and since I speak French, I understood him. He was greatly taken by the fact that there was a lot of hope because the Prime Minister said to Chirac, you won't miss the bus. <laughs> so, so, so they thought, you know, this is a very hopeful sign that uh, something positive is going to come out. Anyway, uh, a few other things. Uh, when I was in Foreign Secretary in June 2003, uh, we wanted very much, uh, and this General Malik uh, would be aware of, although at that time, uh, it was, uh, he had been replaced by his successor. Uh, the operation in, uh, in uh, Bhutan, where Ulfa uh, uh, camps had been established, and we wanted uh, Bhutan to take uh, action against them, eradicate these camps. Uh, <coughs> so the, at, the, at the meeting of the CCS, <laughs> they asked me, to go and talk to the king of Bhutan, uh, which I did, but the Bhutanese king was very, very reluctant uh, to do this operation, fearing this backlash. And he said, I've been let down earlier, and I'll be let down again, because uh, you won't intervene. Anyway, a uh, um, lot of assurances were given to him. Our army general, army chief of staff went subsequently. And he also said that this operation will be led by the Royal Bhutanese Army not by you, because otherwise it will be a serious problem for me internally. But of course, we had made arrangements that should their operation fail, we, we would be in a position uh, to intervene. Eventually, that operation succeeded. Uh, so that was another, but much more important than this, uh, was uh, uh, his visit to China in June 2003. Um, I think, uh, Mr. Bajesh Mishra was extremely uh, keen that we should get the Chinese to recognize Sikkim as an integral part of India. And we were prepared to make some concessions to the Chinese uh, in return. Uh, I was party to those conversations. Uh, I thought, to be frank, that uh, Sikh, every country in the world recognized Sikkim as part of India except China. And therefore, maybe there was not all that much need to make any major concession uh, to China, and we can live with it. But uh, for reasons, political reasons and other reasons I won't go into, they wanted this. And eventually, uh, they didn't agree to immediately recognize Sikkim as part of China, but in the border trade agreement, uh, they agreed to mention the Sikkim state. Uh, and uh, the Changu, Changu in Sikkim state and Ren King Yang, <laughs> or however you pronounce it, in the Tibetan, uh, in the uh, Tibetan autonomous region as the points for border trade. So this was their I indirect way of uh, accepting the Sikkim as part of India, though they promised that they'll change the map uh, very quickly, which they did. Frankly, they waited one or two years. I forget exactly <laughs> the time frame. They took a long time to recognize that. In return, they wanted us to uh, agree to a formulation that the Tibetan Autonomous Region is an integral part of the People's Republic of China. Now, Frankly, neither the foreign minister uh, at that time nor I were terribly in favor of this. And we argued other points. Uh, and then the next morning before the meeting was to begin with the Chinese, uh, we went over the ground again, by which time uh, both the foreign minister and I felt that there was no point in continuing uh, to to give our views on this, because 
at the end of the day, we had already considered everything in 1954. Therefore, it was just sort of playing with words. Um, so we agreed, the Chinese were uh, delighted. Um, I remember when uh, uh, our friend, uh, the Richard Armitage, the Deputy Secretary of State of the United States came to an official visit uh, to have a conversation with me. Uh, he asked me this question. Uh, and I said, look, you know, earlier on this division question, we were going around in circles from left to right, and now we are going from right to left. So it actually doesn't mean anything very much, because we had gone through all the statements that we have made since 1954. And there was a variation here and there. The Dalai Lama was not very happy uh, with this formulation, so I, had sent to, I was sent to brief him <laughs> on this. And the king of Bhutan was not very happy, I had to then go and brief him also and explain to him uh, that it was not anything very, very, very uh, great. The important thing, the other very important thing was the decision to set up the SR uh, mechanism, special representative mechanism. I think India felt that since we had become a nuclear power, uh, China would look at us differently and we may want to accommodate us. So we were speaking from relatively better position to the Chinese on this. Then let us now settle the border issue on a political basis rather than going into legal and historical things. <coughs> and the SR mechanism was intended uh, to do that. Uh, so three, point, three, uh, phase, three steps were uh, decided, one to establish political parameters and guiding principles, which we did in 2005. The initial draft was made when I was foreign secretary, but then later on, the PMO took full control over this. Uh, and they co-opted co uh, an expert from the foreign office, uh, Nirupuma Menon, to actually come help in drafting the parameters. Um, and then established a framework for a final uh, package settlement, and then at the end of it, delineate and demarcate it, demarcate the boundary. So 22 rounds of talks <laughs> happened till 2019 when we had Galwan. So you can't trust the Chinese at all. They'll never live up to any agreement they sign with you, totally opaque, non-transparent. You can't read their minds. And the foreign minister, our present foreign minister, said very pithily that the great charm of doing democracy with China is that we don't know what they think. <laughs> so there it is. Um, then uh, Iraq. That was a big diplomatic challenge we faced because the United States were very keen that we support them, that we deploy our forces there. They said, we can put you in northern Iraq, which is peaceful. You want to have do operations on the ground. They got in touch directly with the defense ministry. Uh, although uh, General Malik's successor told me there was no truth in this, that the defense ministry had already agreed to deploy one or two divisions, whatever it is. But the Americans were working on all fronts uh, to get India uh, involved. In June, Rumsfeld visited India, and he started uh, hectoring our foreign minister, uh, Yoshwan Sinha, saying, yeah, about five, 10 points. OK, these are the 10 points we want. Please, point by point, tell me what you don't agree with. So Yoshwan Sinha said, look, I am not going to get into this game. The point by point rebuttal. We'll talk generally in overall terms. <laughs> so um, anyway. Uh, in the meantime, Shri Advani had visited the United States. And there, for some reason, he gave the impression to the Americans that we would be ready, open to the idea. So when we came back, when he came back, a CCS meeting took place. And you know, it, it, it has its own uh, importance and charm. I was asked to lead the discussion. I didn't know that I would be asked to lead the discussion on our involvement in Iraq. So very quickly, I jotted down some points. On the left side, there were nine points against. On the right side, there were three or four points in favor. So <laughs> I read out those points. And the weight of the argument, I think, to my mind, was pretty convincing. 
And Mr. Adwani was the first to say, no, we will not agree. And then after that, of course, the idea was to get the nation to speak rather than simply the ruling party. And therefore, an all-party conference took place uh, where they issued a communique so that the Americans knew that this was not simply a decision of the ruling party, but an, an all-party decision to strengthen our diplomatic hand <coughs> vis-a-vis the United States. In the meantime, I went to the United States and I told Mr. Mishra that, uh, look, you know, the Americans say that we now want to have a strategic partnership with you, but unless we address the strategic issues, how do we have a strategic partnership, which means missile, nuclear and missile issues? I said I intend to give a non-paper to the Americans to outline what we want. And that way, Mr. Mishra gave you a lot of, uh, even if he was a gatekeeper, he gave you a lot of space. He said, go ahead and do it. He didn't even want to see what my non-paper was, which I submitted. I met Condoleezza Rice. I met uh, Douglas Feith, who was the undersecretary in the State Department, in the Defense Department. And more importantly, I met uh, this fellow, what's his, what's his name, Paul Wolfowitz. Oh real hard-line Americans. Uh, I outlined my arguments. Our ambassador told me uh, that you were pretty hard with Condoleezza Rice. I said, no, I was speaking from brief. Uh, Douglas, uh, uh, Paul Wolfowitz is remarkable. <laughs> he said, we want you to do this for us as a favor. So, uh, I was quite surprised that he's not asking this of us as a favor. And uh, <clears throat> I gave him, I said, look, our position is very clear. If there's a UN resolution, we will do it. But short of a UN resolution, we won't. Later on, there was some kind of a UN resolution, which was not very clear. And then they came back to us, now we got this. In fact, Wolfowitz told me, now we've got this. I said, no, th this doesn't really, amount to a clear-cut decision by the UN uh, to ask countries to participate in the Iraq conflict. Anyway, eventually I think we were very wise, very, very, very wise. And this is the wisdom of uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee, uh, because behind the scenes he was the man who was controlling everything. Bajesh Mishra was just the front, because every morning First thing in the morning, evening, the last thing in the evening, Pradesh Mishra would go to the Prime Minister's home and get his instructions. So, therefore, credit for all this actually should go to the Prime Minister watch by Pradesh Mishra was simply the, the face of his uh, uh, decisions. Uh, anyway, coming back to this whole business about uh, opening the doors to a true strategic partnership with the United States. As a result of the non-paper, the first step that was taken was to set up a high technology control group with Ken Chester as Under Secretary of Commerce and the Foreign Secretary, that is myself, as the co-chairs. And the idea was that we will not address the issue directly, we'll address them indirectly. Uh, and Ken Chester, when he came as ambassador here, recalled those moments with a great deal of uh, nostalgia. And then later on, uh, we decided to have a glide path towards uh, building a strategic understanding. And when the, uh, <coughs> when the, uh, um, their paper was pre presented to us, uh, we were in the um, Prime Minister's office, Bajesh Mishra's office, and uh, I immediately said that, look, uh, you, you're bringing in the whole issue of strategic stability in South Asia. What has that got to do with our strategic partnership? Uh, because the whole problem uh, with that we've had with you over the years is your relationship with Pakistan. And British Minister said, didn't I tell you, he told the Americans, that the Foreign Office is going to find out what you're trying to do. <laughs> so anyway, uh, later on, I had left by that time, then it became the next steps in strategic partnership. Till in 2005, Condoleezza Rice said, forget these next steps, let's go for the whole hog and let's have a nuclear deal. The, the stage was set for that by, in Prime Minister Vajpayee's time. 
is always a continuation in foreign policy. Uh, but the credit of this goes to Prime Minister uh, Wajpai. Uh, finally, a couple of things. <coughs> in September 2003, Prime Minister went to Washington, uh, to New York for the uh, UNGA. He met President Bush, who was extremely respectful, surreying him all the time. Uh, I must say, Prime Minister Bajpai was looked upon with great respect by the world leadership. Uh, they, had, they had heard about him, and uh, they expected that when they had a conversation with him, he will come out with that oratory. Uh, or maybe they were disappointed on that score. Uh, but, but, but they knew his background. And they treated him a lot. The way Bush was behaving like a little boy, I, I'm honestly telling you, with the way he was studying him and everything else. Pity that our Prime Minister didn't, didn't take full advantage of this because he was generally reticent by uh, nature and he didn't have this kind of American flair for casual conversation and small talk and uh, stuff like that. He's a, an elder statesman. A uh, couple of very small, uh, no, then at this UNGA session, <coughs> we sort of hit us violently on uh, the Gujarat riots and everything nasty that he could say, he said. And I had planned that, you know, he will say this immediately, our paper will report this. Our reaction will come much later. So I said, the moment he finishes, I'll go to the press room in the UNGA and give my reaction immediately so that my reaction would come with his statement. So one American journalist asked me, uh, he has offered to shake hands with you. I said, I, we don't shake hands with terrorists. He must first wipe the blood off his hand before he extends it to us. That made headlines <laughs> in India. Half an hour, one hour later, Yushwan Sinha tells me, Prime Minister says that he should give him a job. I said, sir, I gave him a job. Anyway, that was another interesting incident. We went together to Cyprus, and that I that I, then I became acquainted more intimately with his love for food. Because the damn, you know, courses won't end. Fish after fish, this after that, <laughs> it went on and on and on. He, Vajpai was a foodie, he, he loved food. Yes, no, I had that uh, um, very successful visit again. Uh, wherever he went, he was treated, as I said, with <coughs> tremendous respect. <coughs> we have been together to Russia, uh, where we talked about nuclear cooperation, defense cooperation, uh, the issue of spare parts and everything else, which was troubling our armed forces, always delays, increase in prices and stuff like that. Uh, then there was the India-EU EU summit in Denmark, uh, where Bhashwati Mukherjee was the Joint Secretary in charge of Europe. <laughs> And uh, all we wanted them was to agree to the formulation on Kashmir, on terrorism, uh, which we had, they had agreed at the earlier summit. But they won't. They wanted to dilute it. And uh, I said, nothing doing. Then we will not uh, have any uh, statement uh, at all on this issue. Uh, so we stood our ground. And I told Ishwan Sinha that this is the position we should take. And he said, yes, take We will not budge. Then this, uh, sorry to call him an idiot, but the Prime Minister of uh, Denmark, he goes to the uh, press and says uh, something about uh, India blocking this and that and that, which prompted Ishwan Sinha to clarify. And the other members of the, the, the President of the EU Commission, uh, the Foreign Policy Chief, they were very embarrassed, very embarrassed at what the Prime Minister of Denmark had done. Because, uh, and the problem they said is that these small countries, they don't realize the importance of relationship with India. They're in their own small world. They don't have this wider vision, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, uh, th that was, and Prime Minister Vajpayee was, I thought he might be unhappy. <laughs> that we we uh, had a little bit of a, a problem over the communique, but no, I think we maintained our dignity and refused to accept a watered-down version just to give uh, the Danish people a, a diplomatic success. Finally, and I'll end with that, uh, terrorism, Kashmir, and everything else, 
I was very tough personally on Pakistan and on terrorism. Uh, when we had the SARC uh, foreign, minister, foreign secretaries meeting in Kathmandu, uh, the Nepalese always they play kind of at, you know devious games. So they tried to uh, have me uh, interact uh, with the Pakistani Foreign Secretary who happened to be my batchmate. We were together in Lisbon also, nice guy. Uh, I said, look, if I meet him and shake hands with him or do something, the press is going to say that our dialogue has begun. The two foreign secretaries uh, have uh, started to talking to each other. So I said, nothing doing. I'm not going to do that. Anyway, then Fazlul Haq came to India at that time, met Prime Minister Vajpayee, complained to him that your foreign secretary ne bilkuli, he refused to talk to the Pakistani foreign secretary. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know what uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee may have felt about that because behind the scenes, there already were contacts that were going on uh, with Pakistan in Thailand and elsewhere. And that was how the Prime Minister made his visit uh, to Pakistan. By the time I had left, uh, as Foreign Secretary, I would have been against that visit. Uh, but Foreign Secretary has only his views. Uh, and, and, and his views are not policies. They're just an input into policy. But Prime Minister had a larger vision, uh, and I respect him for that because a bureaucrat can think in specific foreign policy terms, but uh, Prime Minister has a larger national responsibility. He has to fit foreign policy into the broad framework of national interest. And therefore, he tried his best. You know, he didn't succeed, but who has succeeded? <laughs> Nobody has succeeded. So there it is. Pakistan is again a lost case, and I don't think we are going to have, for the foreseeable future, normal uh, relations with them. But these are some of the ane anecdotes and interactions uh, that involved me and our, and our uh, Prime Minister. A uh, very gracious man, kind man, uh, thoughtful man, a man of consensus, as I said. Uh, uh, very precise in what he said, even if he said what was, even what he said was little, but very precise in what he said. And he had an aura. He had an aura. You, you knew that you were talking to a statesman. There it is. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your uh, insightful remarks and sharing your anecdotes with the legendary leader. I now invite General V.P. Malik for his remarks. Uh, General V.P. Malik served as 19th Chief of Army Staff of the Indian Army from 1997 and had the privilege to work with Sri Atal Bihari Bajpayee from March 98 to September 2000. He has re received the Ati uh, Vishist Seva Medal and Param Vishist Seva Medal for distinguished service to the Indian Army and the nation. As Army Chief, he planned, co uh, coordinated and oversaw execution of Operation Vijay during the Kargil War in 1999. His expertise in military affairs and subsequent membership of the National Security Advisory Board makes him a prudent voice on India's security issues. Apart from writing opinion columns in newspapers and articles in professional magazines, books, he has authored two books uh, titled Kargil from Surprise to Victory and India's Military Conflict and Diplomacy, an inside view of decision making. Having addressed several universities, corporate organizations and civil and military institutions in India and abroad, Sir, we look forward today uh, to your memoirs about working uh, during Bajpayee years. Over to you, sir. I was worried that you might cut into my 15 minutes. <laughs> Chairperson, sir, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> there are far too many people I know, so it would be difficult for me to name everyone. As she just now mentioned that uh, I had uh, uh, a tenure with uh, Bajpayeeji from the time when he took over second time as Prime Minister. Uh, that was March 98, till I retired on 30th September 2000. And um, during this period, uh, I'll just mention some of the strategic security issues that we went through. 
I'm not going to describe them into detail or not going to those details. But one, of course, was the nuclear test that we did. Um, you heard about that from um, Ambassador Sibyl. Then Lahore bus journey uh, and the Lahore declaration, which unfortunately um, failed, if I can use that word. Kargil war from May to July 99. Then, of course, we saw upsurge in JNK uh, before and after Kargil war. In fact, after Kargil war, we saw fairly intense um, and how he dealt with it. Defense forms, defense reforms after the uh, Cargill Review Committee report had come and the group of ministers, they had given their recommendations on that. Shooting down of Pakistan maritime uh, reconnaissance plane, it took place in August 99 and uh, there was a bit of a problem between the uh, government and the opposition parties for a short while. I'll, um, on that also. Hijacking of uh, IC-814, everybody knows it, and military operations we conducted in Sierra Leone to pull out our troops which had been surrounded by the rebels for a long time. And uh, although the operation was conducted under the UN peacekeeping, but in the background we were the ones who were uh, pushing uh, this particular uh, planning as well as pushing this operation. Um, I want to say two things first. First, of course, is that Mr. Bajpai got us involved in all the discussions on the security issues, and uh, sometimes he would even call us once or twice a day. And during Kargil War, sometimes it happens even three times a day. But he would uh, ask us to brief people, including the opposition party leaders or whoever the governors and chief ministers, sometimes that also happened. But then he was very careful that, uh, perhaps except for one occasion, he told us to go away. He never got us involved in the tutu mama of politics. And uh, he was very careful about that. And the second thing, again, I want to mention here, is that uh, soon after Kargil War, when the preparations were going on for elections, uh, one political party, I think BJP only, they had put up flags of three chiefs. Uh, it happened in uh, Rotak, I think. And immediately after that, I went to him. I said, sir, this cannot be done. And he was very prompt. He says, I totally agree with you. It will not happen again. And after that, we did not see the chiefs or the military getting involved. Uh, in the internal politics, that domestic politics that we have. It was before elections or even after elections. The second thing I want to mention here is that everybody knows he was a great statesman. And um, on strategic issues, my own feeling, my own impression is that except for two occasions, two, uh, in two subjects, where he had some fixed ideas. Otherwise, he was a very open-minded man. Now, those two uh, subjects or issues on which he had a fixed mind, one was <coughs> nuclear. He had made up his mind. And uh, he also quoted, You know that very famous word. Uh, so he had made up his mind on the nuclear, and he didn't ask anyone else. He didn't consult us also till we were absolutely ready to go for that. That was one where he had made up his mind. The second one was uh, about Pakistan. My feeling is that he had that fixed idea that I have to make peace with Pakistan. And uh, certain places we may not have agreed. For example, after Kargil War, uh, when they, Pakistan invited me to go there. So I asked him, and uh, he says, Phir aap I said, no, I will not go. You know, I told him point blank, I said, I will not go. I think he was a little disappointed when I said, no, I won't go. And I would not have agreed with his decision where he called Pervez Musharraf, you know, soon after uh, uh, the war. You know, because I felt that our people in the armed forces would not have liked. I'm just 
mentioning these ideas where he was uh, on Kashmir, he was quite firm. He wanted peaceful sol solution. He never stopped us from carrying out offensive operations or chasing them. But he always kept us, kept in his mind and he guided us that look, this Jamhuriyat, Kashmiriyat and all that and don't overdo these things here. It's unfortunate that we've had this incident two days ago, over to three weeks. But we were warned that these things are and we tried to follow that uh, to the extent it was possible. Um, so I found him open-minded on strategic issues. He would not only consult us very readily, but he would also consult all his colleagues before taking a final decision. And when he took the decision thereafter, he was very firm. He did not deviate from, you know, uh, on the nuclear test, I think uh, Ambassador Sibyl has already said uh, about it, so I won't uh, talk about it. On the Lahore bus journey, I thought that it was a good idea. I mean, after all, he was a statesman, he was a visionary, and he took that uh, journey. Uh, it was unfortunate that uh, the politics in Pakistan uh, didn't play up to what he, he wanted. I come to Kargil where we had a lot of interaction with each other. It was a shock, no doubt about it. And um, for him it was a big shock, bigger shock. Till about 17th of June he still was wondering why has Pakistan created this problem. And uh, I remember he sent Mr. Mishra uh, to Pakistan. It was around about middle of uh, June to ask him ki ye kya ho raha hai? Mind you, we were in trouble because the intelligence reports were also telling us that these are jihadi, these are... Uh, and you know, nobody was telling us that Pakistan is now launching uh, literally an attack on us. Because now it is confirmed that there were no jihadis, it was all entirely Pakistan army. So there was a lot of confusion and he was himself uh, wanting to be sure that what is happening and that is why he sent Mr. Bishra to Islamabad to ask him that question. Um, he, throughout, once he had given that decision, um, I briefed him, I think, on the 23rd of May or 24th of May, after I had come back from Poland and Czech Republic. And then after visiting this area, I briefed the cabinet in the ops room. And uh, I told him, that look, the situation is more serious than we thought, and we will have to launch all the three services together. We will have to make a strategic plan based on Army, Navy, and Air Force. Till that time, the Air Force had been refused uh, to participate. So he uh, immediately said, okay, no problem. But of course, the restriction was that you will not go, uh, line, you will not cross the line of control our international border, which we took it at that time. But Mr. Bajpai thereafter made public statement twice that I have told the armed forces not to cross the line of control or international border. And the second thing, second time it happened on 3rd of June, he had said that I think in Chennai, when he came back, three of us were walking. Uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Vijesh Mishra and I, we were walking in the corridors of South Block and I told him, I said, sir, my request is please don't make the statement again. Oh, everybody knows he was a, you know, person of very few words. So he looked at me, kya baat hai? You know, he didn't say anything. He, he just questioned me. So I told him, I said, sir, we will do our best to undo what has happened in Kargil sector. But in case we cannot do that, then we will have no alternative except to cross the line of control or international border. And when I come with that request, then what will be your answer? He kept quiet, he didn't say anything. And that very evening, Mr. Bijesh Bishra took an interview on a TV channel and he said, not crossing the line of control or international border holds good today, we don't know about tomorrow. <laughs> Again, here I give credit to his open-mindedness. You know, this question never came up late, uh, later. 
but i got the hint that okay it will be all right if you have to do that and i was able to deploy all my forces on the western border except for what we had to keep on the northern side and we were quite prepared thereafter that if there is a requirement then we will go the requirement did not come because um, you know after some time um, the political aim given to us had been achieved so that that is how the ceasefire and all that came and this whole thing about pressure from the uh, from the us is also not quite right because uh, the us president Pre president clinton he wanted bajpai ji to come on the same day that nawaz sharif was visiting uh, washington dc on the 4th of july and uh, mr bajpai refused he said main nahi aaunga my condition is firm that they have to withdraw from the ceasefire otherwise i am not coming at all and he didn't go so all the decision they were taken um, by him uh, with a lot of consultation i just briefly mention about ic814 at that time we were not members of the we, the military was not member of the crisis uh, committee crisis management committee that we were for two days we were not called although i knew ke kya ho kya raha hai all of us we knew it in the and then he suddenly he rang me up he says ke jan sahab aap aaye nahi aaiye so i went there then he discussed that and thereafter i'm not going into negotiation that were taking place uh, between the the intelligence agencies and the on the politics side but um, on the final day i think it was 30th of december if i recall when they had decided to uh, you know um, mr jaswan singh to go to afghanistan and get our um, people from the plane back um they had already taken a decision the cabinet and when they came to the room where we were sitting uh, the officials i could make out that the decision has been taken and uh, they were all ready mr jaswan singh was ready to go so i asked this question i said sir i am not disclosing something which is probably not come in the books anywhere and i said sir this is fine you made up your mind that we will have to get them free like this and those three people will be taken but should the foreign minister go there was silence for some time and then i must say in front of everybody he asked cabinet ministers kyon aapko kya kehna hai so here was a person before taking that mind you they took the decision that mr jaswan singh will go but that decision was taken after hearing us and also consulting the cabinet final say and final decision has to be of the cabinet under the prime minister i mean we can't claim uh, that kind of a thing but what it gave you uh, the impression was that he was prepared to discuss that matter if somebody objected to and the same kind of a thing happened so many times he would ask acha aapko kya kehna hai other ministers and all on kashmir um, i won't say anything more except that he was bent upon winning the hearts and minds of the people as we call it in the army and uh, therefore whatever we did he was couple of times i remember he took me along there was one incident in pahalgam where the terrorists had killed four or five two, um, pilgrims who were going to this thing and he said aap mere sath chaliye and then he wanted us to be they wanted him to be briefed uh, so he he mentioned that the other thing that i want to mention here is that um, he was genuinely fond of troops genuinely fond of troops and he his heart bled whenever he heard of the casualties and i know that during kargil war every day we had to brief him ke itne aadmi kal mar gaye so one could see the wincing on his uh, and one of the reasons that he gave me uh, when we were initially i had not agreed to ceasefire 
you know, I had said no. That day we met three times. And uh, one of the reasons he says, your casualties have been very high. So if you want to fight again, and uh, you want to carry on, then there will be more casualties. I said, sir, war me, I cannot say that there will be no casualties. But that was one point that he had. He visited the hospitals in Srinagar. He visited the hospital in Udhampur. And mind you, our own president did not go, even when I had requested him to go. So he was a man who really wanted. He was the one who brought, uh, who sanctioned ECHS scheme. Today, all the Fauji's know the value of ECHS, the you know, uh, health scheme that we, we managed to. It had taken us almost about eight, nine years, but Mr. Bajpai took the decision. He said, no. Ye baat thik hai, aapki huni hoegi hai. So they were um, visiting the uh, grant of the war casualties. When the war casualties uh, were taking place, one day I went to him, I said, sir, um, the money that we are paying to these families is not good enough. It was very, uh, so he says, aapko kitna chahiye? I had not thought in detail. So I rang up somebody and he gave me figures, which I put it on a pencil paper, gave it to Shakti Sinha. And uh, so I, in fact, I told my own staff officer, I said, yes, you are asking a lot. You know, and uh, he, his answer was, he said, sir, if you ask so much, you will get half. You know how the bureaucracy works here. <laughs> <laughs> but I did not, so I gave it to him. Every bit that was written by me on, on that paper was sanctioned. Every bit was sanctioned. So that was Mr. Bajpai. Uh, I would consider him uh, not only a statesman, very open-minded on uh, strategic issues, never interfered in our day-to-day -day thing. He was a man of macro level, you know. And not nut and bolts, that was our job. And if we had any problem, we never went to him. In fact, we went to Bajesh Mishra to get those things sorted out, and they were sorted out. So we had a very good team, I must say, uh, during the period that I served uh, with Mr. Bajpai as well as Bajesh Mishra. And um, a man, I think, uh, we naturally, we, we uh, uh, great man and today everybody is talking uh, one has experienced that and uh, one one feels sorry that i had to leave but more things were happening but then that was uh, and uh, i just want to say peace loving poet um, again if you were to read his poems which i have read a few you know again he comes across a man who feels the pain but even during that period, he's very firm in what he wants to. I mean, there's an English translation I want to, my poetry is a declaration of war. And he's fighting, whether it is domestic or his own personal medical problem, you know, he's talking about that. It is not rhetoric. It is not a defended soldier's, defeated soldier's drumbeat of despair. But the fighting warrior's will to win. That was his firmness inside. It is not the dispirited voice of dejection, but the stirring shout of victory. That is what I found, Mr. Bajpai. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed, a noble soul he was. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking and inspiring remarks about this visionary leader. May I now have the privilege to invite Shri Suresh Prabhuji for chair's remarks. Sri Suresh Prabhuji, a veteran politician and a chartered accountant by profession, has held various cabinet portfolios and is known for his out-of-the-box thinking, which has led him to contribute to various reforms and effected organizational transformations. He joined politics in March 1996 when he contested for the first time. He has been in Indian Parliament from 1996 onward. He has also held several important cabinet portfolios at the union level in Government of India, including industry, fertilizer and chemicals, uh, power, environment and forest, railways, civil aviation, commerce and industry. 
He was also the chairperson of the task force for interlinking of rivers. And also, he was designated as India's Sherpa to the G20 and G7. On the international front, he has been a significant member of international organizations and renowned global NGOs. He is also a visiting professor of London School of Economics and Political Science founder, chancellor of Rishihut University, and also chairman governing council at the India Foundation. Over to you, sir. Good evening, friends. For me, it's a great honor and sense of happiness that India Foundation has been organized this event the last several years, and it's the sixth session, <coughs> sixth edition in this continuing tradition of organizing memorial lecture to celebrate the great life that Atal Bari Vajpayee lived. And today is the first time that the format of lecture is a little bit modified. Otherwise, there was a person who was delivering a lecture. And then he started with, I think, Arun Jetli was the first one, then it continued with many others, which you just saw. And it's the first time we have a different format, and I very, it is good that we could look at Atalji's great personality from a different facets. Of course, we had to bring then probably 20, 30 people together to talk about Atalji because he had that many different traits to his personality. But security, foreign policy, one of his great fortes, he has made a great contribution in that. I therefore am very happy that we could hear about that. Atalji, for me, had a completely different kind of experience with Atalji. First, of course, as a student, I would take out a public transport and go wherever possible to listen to him. And I could see him probably from several hundred meters away. And I to always store in my memory great ideas that he had spoken about. And if I could never imagine that I will be able to go even closer to him, Leopard sitting with him. And then it so happened that in 1996, when he took oath as a prime minister for the first time, I took also oath with him, along with very few ministers, that government didn't last for too long. And then he took oath two more times, so in all he took oath three times, and I was probably three or four, or probably three, ministers who took oath with him on all three occasions. <laughs> and that was, once I, first he asked, because I didn't know him, I didn't, I mean, he didn't know me, so he asked Pramod Mahajan, so he, I was introduced to him. And then I was surprised that people used to tell me that Atalji likes you. I said, he never speaks to me. I don't know how can he like me. <laughs> and one of a great trait of his personality was there would be a lot of space to anybody. You can go on talking and you will keep on listening. And that particular trait helped of the junior most probably, and I, of course at that time I was the youngest cabinet minister. But since then I've seen, I mean, then I saw that he would allow anybody to just be at ease and not to be overawed by his towering personality. One of the great things about Atalji was he led a government in 96, 98, and again in 2099 and till 2004. These governments, they're all coalition governments. And in that coalition government, there were many stalwarts. Of course, from his own party, like Advani Ji and others, but even from not his party, George Fernandes, Nitish Kumar, Mamta Banerjee, Ram Vilas Paswan, Sharad Yadav, and all these people were 
working. I mean, they're all having their own independent parties. They also grown together as politicians. And many times it would happen that in the cabinet meeting there will be a lot of heated discussion. And I was thinking, my God, what is going to happen? Because this all these stalwarts. And finally, Atalji will say, "Thik hai." That's all. So somebody will say, "Apne thik hai, bola to thik hai." So all these great leaders who had their own opinion, they knew one thing that Atalji is the last word. We have to respect it, accept it. And they also knew that when he had said something, thik hai, so he knew obviously because there are as many different political opinions in the cabinet that how could anybody have a unanimity on any issue at all? So that's what his great personality carried a coalition government of a different political party, I would say a more disparate kind of political dispensation, but that ran very successfully. And what was the result? This was one of the most successful government in terms of achieving high economic growth. It laid the foundation for a future economic growth and even subsequent government that came in 2004, actually that benefited immensely from the foundation that was laid by Atalji during his tenure as a prime minister. Fundamental changes were made including one law which he passed called Fiscal Responsible Budget Management Law, which of course the first thing what happened was in 2004 when the UPA government took over, the first thing they said that we agree with the law but we'll postpone its implementation. So it got diluted and never got what it should have done. Otherwise that was one law. Nowadays when we talk about some of the states giving freebies and our present Prime Minister also talk about revenue culture, that could have been probably addressed if FRBM, Fiscal Responsible Budget Management Act, would have been implemented. But he actually laid the foundation for infrastructure growth, which was unprecedented. Today we are talking about roads and we are taking it for granted that roads have to be good. But just imagine when he started that program, the road connectivity and that too. There's one road connectivity that we know to connect major cities, but there are other road connectivity program we launched was Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. There was another one he launched, which actually uh, <coughs> now getting implemented called Sagar Mala, because he wanted to connect all the ports to the hinterland. And I, because I was representing a constituency, which was coastal constituency, so I told Atalji once, I said, sir, ye, koi bhi minor jo hai, ek din to major ban jata hai. Any person who is born will become minor and then will become major. But in our country, minor ports minor are minor. They are never made major. This is the definition of minor ports and major ports. So he understood it. Then he worked. And actually, we had a major program called Sagar Mala. So the point I am saying is the amount of investment and I would say the laying the foundation for future economic growth through investment and through infrastructure was initiated during his tenure in a very significant way. Connectivity. It was his time that telecom connectivity got it. I was also handling one of the major issues of interlink of rivers and he was so passionate about it and that again was related to connectivity. So road connectivity, telecom connectivity, water connectivity in fact also he had a great emotional connectivity to all the people of India but connectivity was his forte and that's what he worked on. I must really mention this because I think this is very important. In 2000, I was, uh, Prime Minister called me, I was a Minister of Chemicals and Fertilizer. I was in Washington DC to attend a World Bank meeting. I came and he said, you have to be a power minister. So we worked on power sector. I made a presentation to the cabinet. It was very unusual. because Normally cabinet only deals with subject matter which is there in the agenda. This was a sector specific presentation. And then he said, okay, up career. So we completely revamped the power sector. We introduced the Electricity Act, which was politically very inconvenient because that would have meant that we'll appoint regulators who will increase tariff, because regulators are not appointed to reduce tariff. They will obviously, because there are only low tariffs, so they'll result into increased tariff. He supported it, and what is the result? We had 18% peak level shortage in year 2002, 18%. 
Today, if we are not introduced that law, Electricity Act 2003, and which became now law, and then of course we had to, I took to each and every state, and Ratel ji actually had liked that idea, went each and every state, met all the political parties, all the farmers organization, all the trade unions, everybody. And we got almost a unanimity, not unanimity, but consensus to support this legislation, which got finally passed. Today, had we not done that law, and if Prime Minister Vajpayee was not a Prime Minister to support it politically, there wouldn't be probably a power shortage, I don't know, even 50, 60 percent. Because states had no money. Private sector had no way of coming in because the 1948 law had nationalized the entire power sector, so there was no provision. So Electricity Act actually paved the way for transformation of the electricity sector, thanks to Atalji's great leadership and support as a prime minister. I know so many had opposed it, so even in the cabinet, but he said, no, ye hona hi chahiye, and that he had that great, great sense of understanding it. So I think he could do something, and he knew one thing as a politician, that elections, and no one knows it better than him, because as you just saw, 1957, he became member of parliament for the first time. And since then, of course, his graph was climbing. And he had a fantastic connect with all parts of the country. Any person, anybody would love him, respect him. So he knew that elections are won on emotions. So he said in a small group once, Chunao jitne ke liye to emotions ki jarurat hai. Lekin log chate hamara vikas ho. So log chate vikas ho, ham chunao jitne ke liye radniti ke log emotions ka istimal karenge aur chunao jitne ki koshish karenge. Why not make emotion is an issue? Why not make development as an emotional issue? Why not make development as an emotional issue so automatically both the things will happen? Can we make that? And that is something which he was always thinking. So as a great leader like Atalji, who did so many changes in one small period of six, seven years, and that laid the foundation for the future growth. So it is obviously his life he will keep inspiring many, many people to come. I'll just end by just being small personal anecdote. When I was a power minister, I was asked to resign by the party that I was belonging to. So I went to Atalji and I said, uh, sorry, Mira, it's stiff way. So he said, uh, it was one o'clock. Of course, his PS was saying, please tell me, he will ask me why you want to meet him. I said, not urgently. Anyway, he rang the bell and called, told somebody to take soup. Like you. So I said, sir, I'm in the soup and you are giving me soup. <laughs> So he said, I gave him the paper, he gave him back. He did not accept my resignation for more than two weeks. Finally, he had to accept it, but two weeks he didn't accept. A most dispensable commodity, person who had no reason that, you know, I was in no position to cause any political upheaval of any kind, he actually Continue, uh, asked me to continue for then, of course, the moment I resigned, within a few weeks he made me chairman of the Internet of Rivers with a <laughs> responsibility, I mean, with a protocol of a different kind. But why I'm saying is, Atalji was a politician. He, under, he understood politics better than anybody at that time, but he also was a great human being who understood human and human beings better than anybody else. And that's why political expediency was important for him, obviously, but he also understood the personal and personal relationship more than anything else. So such a great man. And I really, I always think about him as a father figure who gave me that paternal love. But more importantly, I always look up to him for so many things and what he talked and what he didn't, what he said is very important. But his silence was more eloquent many times. He didn't say many times certain things as if nothing has happened. I will just tell you because you mentioned after nuclear test, the UK, the De then Deputy Prime Minister, John Pescott, Tony Blair was the Prime Minister. He sent him here to meet and with John Pescott was my friend because he was also the Minister for Environment while we Deputy Prime Minister. So I don't know why, but actually normally Prime Minister, he is calling on the Prime Minister. I should not be there, but Prime Minister called me. So he, mentioned I was, and he also was a very 
very interesting person, a very nice person. He, was, he belongs to old labor, where Tony Labor was, Tony Blair, people used to say new labor. So he said in a jocular way that I was uh, swimming in Maldives before I came here, and I was worried that what you fired should not sit there and I will get harm. So all the people in the world are, so he just smiled and smiled, so he didn't know what is it now, what, what he should say. He was not saying anything, he was just saying, when he was speaking and he was just listening and smiling. Afterward, he said, I'm glad that you don't have anything to do with the nuclear test. We said in English, then we ended the talk. But he was that great, his silence was sometimes more eloquent than his own great speeches that he made. And such a great leader, I learned so much from him. I owe a lot to him. And I'm very happy that this time, as well as on some other editions, I could participate in this program on behalf of India Foundation. So India Foundation owes a lot to him, like most of the Indians do. And I think we'll continue to make sure that his legacy goes forward. And we'll make sure that we keep organizing programs like this. The next year is 100th year or what is it? So I think we'll have to do a much bigger event. We'll start planning about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your comprehensive remarks and sharing your rich experience of having worked with Atalji during his tenure as the Prime Minister of India. After this, uh, these three lectures, we have reached almost end of the program, and now is the time for felicitation of the dignitaries. May I now request Sri Suresh Prabhuji to felicitate our guests on the dais with a memento on behalf of India Foundation to Ambassador Kaval Sibyl. Uh, to General B.P. Malik now. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to call upon Admiral Shekhar Sinhaji, Chairman, Board of Trust Trustees, India Foundation, to felicitate Sri Suresh Prabhuji with a token of appreciation from India Foundation. Thank you, sir, for doing the honor. Now, may I request Captain Alok Bansal, Director, India Foundation, for a vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. With this, it's now my responsibility at the end to propose a vote of thanks. Bharat Ratna Atal Bihari Bajpayee was a great human being, as has been brought out, as we heard all the three speakers. He was undoubtedly an iconic leader who will always be remembered as the one who transformed India. A great orator, poet and statesman par excellence. He was the first non-Congress Prime Minister who served the nation for over five years. He strengthened India by making it a credible nuclear power and showed his diplomatic finesse by bringing it on the global pedestal despite the sanctions imposed. Atalji also played a critical role in increasing the vibrancy of Indian democracy by ushering in a unique pluralism in the political spectrum. To pay tribute to Atalji, India Foundation has been organizing Atal Bihari Vajpayee Memorial Lectures close to his birth date to remember a visionary who was admired across the political divide. Last year, during the Atal Bihari Vajpayee Memorial Lecture, the former president of India, Sri Ramnath Kovinji, had stated that Atalji is regarded as the Ajat Shatru of Indian politics, a political stalwart without any enemies across the spectrum. For ages to come, Atalji shall remain etched in our memories as a democrat, statesman, and a leader. This year, we were fortunate. And as uh, Sureshji said, we had a different format. We were fortunate in getting three luminaries who were themselves fortunate to interact with Atalji. We had Honorable Sulesh Prabhuji, who was a member of Atalji's cabinet to chair the session. General VP Malik, who was the chief of the army staff during the momentous Kargil conflict. And Sri Kaval Sibbal, who was the foreign secretary under his prime ministership. I'm sure you'll all agree that all of them enlightened you with their rare anecdotes, reminiscences, which were very, very valuable. And I think all of them are extremely busy. Uh, some of them live outside Delhi. 
We are extremely fortunate and extremely grateful to them for taking time out from their busy schedules to be here with us today to share their reminiscences with you. We are also grateful to Ambassador Bhaswati Mukherjee, Sri Sunit Tandan, Sri Sandeep Kapoor, and the entire staff of India Habitat Center for their unstinted support. They went out of their way to help us, and without their support, this event would not have been feasible. I'll be failing in my duties if I don't acknowledge the efforts put in by India Foundation team for the lecture. Under the visionary leadership of Dr. Ram Madha, I'd particularly like to thank Diksha Goyal and Yashovardhan Tewari for the efforts put in. Finally, the program would not have been a success without you, ladies and gentlemen. We are immensely grateful to you all for taking time out from your busy schedules in this cold, wintry evening to be here with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I hope your support will always be with us. Thank you. And wish you all a very happy and joyous new year on behalf of India Foundation. Thank you.